Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 3rd, 2018 school committee meeting. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here this evening. Um, we've had our call to order. Um, two, we don't have any minutes to approve this evening. I think there are some drafts circulating. I saw one today, but we don't have any for approval tonight, so nothing under that. Um, Item number three, questions and comments. This is the part of the meeting that we have set aside for any audience questions, comments, concerns. Anyone here for that? All right. Seeing none, um, we'll move on um, to the superintendent's report. So um, as you will note, Dr. Gallo is still out on leave um, and as part of her delegation of certain authorities um, to John Ferris and Dr. LaBilwa. Dr. LaBilwa will be presiding over the meeting tonight with us, so I will leave it to you for your superintendent's report. Yes, good evening everyone. Uh, happy Hanukkah for those who celebrate, as well as happy National Inclusive Schools Week. Uh, so today kicked off our uh, district-wide celebration of the National Inclusive Schools Week with activities uh, really across all six of our schools, celebrating inc inclusion and diversity. Um, and encouraging our community to be as welcoming and open as possible. So um, we'll keep the community up to date as the week goes on through our social media feeds relative to activities and celebrations. But um, uh, from all reports today, it was a great first day of celebrations throughout the district. Um, a couple of qu uh, quick things to make you aware of. Um, last, uh, the, the, the Wednesday prior Thanksgiving, uh, just as an aside to the committee, we, I, I mentioned it was coming at the last meeting on the 19th, but um, WGBH did air a, uh, we were part three of a three-part series uh, about digital literacy and, and computer science, um, highlighting our elementary computer science initiative um, on WGBH on All Things Considered and Morning Edition. So we're incredibly proud of the, um, the work that our educators have been doing, and it, it's being highlighted uh, on a uh, local level like that, which is a great opportunity for us. Um, also in your packet, just as uh, for informational item, we have the 2018 winter coaching assignments uh, for your review, uh, as well as the November 2018 facilities report, which outlines those activities that were completed during the month of November and those that are um, on deck to be completed during the month of December. Uh, yes, yeah, sure, Liza. Yes. Yeah. Um, on the winter coaching assignments, Um, I noticed that a lot of the girls' sports were, were have fewer female coaches than we have in the past, and that I know it's challenging. We have great coaches, and it's challenging to recruit coaches. But um, if we can just, as as we're going along with our athletic program, if we can consider that as, you know, how do we make sure we, we have female coaches? And if there are challenges in getting female coaches, to bring that to our attention, that you know, if it's financial or availability or you know, who's, who's good in the sport. Um, but I just noticed it was something that stood out to me seeing these coaching assignments um, and something I'd like us to be aware of. And if we can just keep that going or sure. get back to us about what's happening with that type of thing. I would appreciate that. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. Um, uh, so uh, uh, also in your packet is a copy of the Hingham Tiered System of Support Dear Community letter, uh, which is giving the community an update relative to our progress with our social emotional initiative. And we have uh, Heather Rodriguez, our Director of Counseling, to speak very briefly to that letter and answer any questions the community may have relative to the, that letter that was sent out. Heather. Thank you. Um, so yes, we, had, we sent out a letter. It is two pages of single space, very dense, lots of information in it. Um, so we do apologize kind of for the length, but we have a lot of really great things going on. So we wanted to make sure that the community was really well abreast of all of the um, efforts that we've been making through the past couple of years coming to fruition. So we have um, curriculum, the toolbox program at the elementary level that has rolled out and teachers have been trained and it's phenomenal and a lot of enthusiasm. It's being implemented much faster and with greater enthusiasm than we could ever have expected. So that's phenomenal. Um, and there's just a lot of excitement between any kind of staff member and the kids, and it's great. Um, we are in the midst of screenings 
for universal screening for all of our students. Um, the elementary schools have begun that process already. The high school and middle school will in the next week or so be doing that as well. Um, and then we will roll out our intervention programs for any students who screen high in a certain risk area or just kind of come up with plans what's appropriate to intervene for those particular students that may have specific needs. Um, and then we're continuing the HCSS task force work um, just to follow through and make sure that everything is rolling out smoothly and that we're um, creating longevity and making sure that this is a long-standing program um, and just a part of what we do on an everyday basis for years and years and years to come. Okay. So that's it. Thank you, Heather. Thanks. And I will note as an aside that we do have a presentation scheduled for the committee on the toolbox program um, for January. So that will be forthcoming. So we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, and the last thing to note uh, is we do have a special guest with us tonight, Lauren Sioka, who's a middle school uh, ELA teacher who's here to talk to us a little bit about the program that the middle school implemented, um, the One Book, One School program. Um, and she's going to speak to you briefly while I show you some um, great pictures that highlight the, ac the activity at the middle school. So this occurred on the early release day. Um, and as you know, going, heading into the summer, the entire middle school selected the same uh, book to read for summer reading. So Lauren, take it away. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, the ninth, I believe it was. was it? Yeah, the seventh. Seventh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, this is great to be here. Yeah, I just wanted to share with you what we did on the seventh. It was an early release day at, at Hingham Middle School. And uh, we devoted the day to this, the book that we read over the summer. Uh, that was entitled Refugee by Alan Gratz. So um, this was really the first time that we devoted an entire day to this type of workshop-led um, student activity uh, day that incorporated all three grades. So it was really exciting to do this for the first time. But we have, in the past two years, devoted one day in the fall to the summer reading book that became the all-school summer read. So we started off the day with listening to Alan Gratz, who was the, the author of the book he had um, put together a YouTube video that was answering questions that readers had about the book, kind of to anchor the day back into the book and to remind the kids also of the book since it had been a little bit of time since they read it. Uh, so students rotated through three workshops that were co-led by teachers uh, throughout the building. The workshops were inquiry-based topics that focused on the themes of the novel. Uh, the novel which, um, as I mentioned, is, was Refugee, is written in three different narratives, and they are woven together, especially at the end. So each character represents a voice from three different times and places in history, uh, Nazi Germany in the 1930s, Castro's Cuba in the 1990s, and Syria in 2015. So the first workshop uh, that students rotated through was called Maintaining Hope which was a theme of the novel. And students really focused on how the characters and how people maintain hope through facing um, adversity. So students had to produce an artistic representation of the theme, and the products could be digitally produced or on paper with colored pencils. So hope was, was the theme of, of that. And this was one of the, the digital representations that a student had produced in class. And then they rotated into the workshop decisions and solutions, and they really thought about and considered the, the extreme decisions that refugees have to make and how to creatively and, and critically think of some, uh, some solutions. And one of the characters in the book, his, the, the boy's father, relies on his iPhone to take him places and to make connections. So we talked a lot about, well, if you could create an app, what kind of app would you create that could help a refugee situation? So you see a student creating an app here, and on the next slide are two student-created ideas, which were, which were really cool. They had some really great creative ideas, and they worked together collaborating on this. And then the third was historical connections. And obviously, as I mentioned, this book made a lot of connections with history and it was a gr grand context really to to try to tackle um, you know for our kids and and just in terms of really focusing on that in during the day so they took some time and they created a travel document for this for one of the characters and then took events historical events and placed them on a timeline and also walked through a gallery walk which incorporated some uh, you know, primary source documents. 
and um, and they had they had a, a great time. Teachers worked together. It was a really great opportunity for teachers to kind of step a little bit out of their comfort zone. We had like you know phys ed teachers working alongside math teachers, and so it was a great day of collaboration and inclusion. And we consider it to have been a success and something that we hope to do again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks Thank you. So much. Thank you. So I thought it would be helpful to hear from uh, the individuals, all the great work that's happening in the schools and a really great uh, uh, community building activity for our middle school. And I think that concludes the superintendent's report. So I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Okay, thank you. Um, slide right back over here with communications and then communications received by superintendent. Uh, okay. None. None. Yeah. All right. Then 5.2, um, student communications from her student representative, Emma Tolte. Um, as you said before, this week kicks off the um, All-Inclusive Schools Week. Um, this will provide a good opportunity to reflect and show how our school strives to serve all students in Hingham. Um, the Veterans Appreciation Club is collecting warm hats, gloves, coats, blankets, socks, and sleeping bags for homeless veterans. Um, the box for don the donations is in the high school lo front lobby. A junior, Lizzie Quinlevin, is one of our four winners from more than 100 high school student writers in the Harvard Crimson High School Journal. There will be a ping pong fundraiser on Wednesday for Stucco to raise money for Stucco, and the Hingham High School Mentor Group will also be helping run this event. Uh, Stucco is putting together a Pack the Pantry holiday drive, and this will run through December. As it is the holiday season, Christmas in the Square is this weekend, and several members of the Hingham High School will help make that a fun night for the younger generations. And winter sports um, tryouts seem to have wrapped up and are off to try to win some state championships. Thank you. Great job, Emma. Thank you. Thank you Emma. Great job. Um, 5.3 other communications. I, um, I actually cards I'm going to pass around that we received from folks here in central office um, for folks to read and Libby did you yeah. have something Go ahead. so um, I want to make sure that I say out loud uh, something that I was thinking at the last meeting the last school committee meeting and I just didn't have the wherewithal to put it into words and it's about the, uh, Dr. Jamie's report on the MCAS and uh, and the results and my initial reaction is wow and congratulations to all of the teachers on a job really well done. And um, to recognize out loud that Hingham consistently ranks in the top of, of our benchmark schools. And I want to acknowledge um, that getting good grades on the MCAS requires walking a very fine line between teaching to the test and keeping up a robust curriculum that maintains the students interests and keeps them active in their own learning and um, keeps them happy and healthy socially and emotionally so it's a it's a lot to juggle for all of the teachers all at the same time it's a, they're balancing an invisible rope and um, I just want to acknowledge the skill that's involved and uh, to say congratulations again and thank you very much for all of your hard work. Where's the camera? Because this is going out to all the teachers. I don't even know where it is. And uh, thank you for all of your hard work and dedication. Please make sure that that gets back to your partners. Thank you. Right. I'll let them all know tomorrow. Thank you. Um, thanks, Libby. Um, all right. Um, new business 6.1 to receive the Hingham High School Improvement Plan for 2018 19 and an update for. 2017-18 plan progress. Rick Swanson, thank you. Right, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Libby, for those very kind words. I'll be sure to pass those along to the teachers at the high school, as I'm sure my colleagues at the other buildings will, will do. And uh, I'll do my very best to continue the, the feel-good start that you've given us here. And I'm happy to be, um, I, I guess, the final of the six school improvement plans that, that you will have heard this fall. And although it's, it seems a bit out of date to be reporting to you on our progress from the 2017-2018 school year, uh, so much of the important work that we began last year in implementing the, the last school improvement plan certainly continues, and, and so much of it is ongoing and I think really never ending. Um, so the presentation that I have for you tonight really highlights 
our four main school improvement goals from last year, and then we'll offer a preview of the things that we intend to really focus on in the year ahead. So um, the first of our goals from last year, as you may recall, um, first of uh, what uh, four highlighted goals, the endless goals that we work on every year. Um, but here's the first of our four official school improvement goals that our school council had articulated and worked on all year. The first was to explore ways to expand service learning opportunities for HHS students. And we've marked it as in progress and actually extended that goal into the current year and have listed it once again in the 2018-2019 school improvement plan. But I'm proud to say that throughout the past year, I think we made some really impressive strides in offering a very robust set of service learning opportunities to our students and I'll highlight just a few of them here and I've got some photographs that I think you'll enjoy. The first is from the Harborman Helping Hingham Day which is the community-wide day of community service that almost every single one of our graduating seniors completed last year. This was the second annual uh, it will certainly continue this year and we'll be presenting a third annual Harborman Helping Hingham Day. I envision this becoming a really cherished part of our school culture and a tradition that will last for many, many years to come. Uh, and so you, you see there, um, I don't know if they're all in the picture, but we, we sent about 300 students out into the community to work on a whole host of different projects that day. Uh, really captures, I think, so much of what our school strives to stand for and was a great capstone experience for our graduating seniors. As far as service learning, I think there, there are so many examples that I could offer of engagement by clubs and the 50 or so clubs that our high school offers. There's a photograph from just a few weeks ago at a beach cleanup that our biology club uh, completed. There's a shot of our Veterans Appreciation Club, which has really grown into one of our most <laughs> active clubs, making a difference on almost a weekly basis, it seems. They are doing something really impressive. Here's them presenting a very significant check uh, to an organization last spring and if you're following the high school Twitter at all you would have seen a couple of new announcements just today for work they did over the weekend where they had packed 150 holiday bags for uh, veterans in the community and they're now launching a uh, coat drive for homeless veterans in Boston this group is doing some amazing work so many of our athletic teams, I think almost all of our athletic teams, have completed impressive community service projects. None last year more impressive than our volleyball team, who was actually awarded a community service award in a statewide competition by the MIAA. And you see them being awarded that certificate last year before one of our home tournament basketball games. Really impressive achievement by them for supporting a number of different causes throughout the fall season. We even see it in the academic environment as well. A project that has become particularly well known is the extreme couponing competition that's probably going on five or six years now uh, in math classes that apply their algebraic skills to trying to figure out how can you get the most bang for your buck with a $500 check provided by the PTO. They're uh, producing, I think, $1,000 or so worth of food for a donation to the Hingham Food Pantry. Uh, a great service learning opportunity there. Here's a project that emerged from some Spanish classes last year, raising um, supplies for hurricane refugees. And you see from the photograph on the right that the couple of cars they had initially planned to use to deliver uh, what they had collected was insufficient to the point where we had to ask John if he could help us get a school bus to deliver all of those supplies. So the outpouring of support really on the backs of great work by uh, one particular teacher, Laura Kelly, alongside Stacy Preddy uh, and her students. And the international service trips that we've run several of in recent years, and we have another one going this year back to the Dominican Republic for the third time. And so I've highlighted just a few here in these slides. There are so many more that I could talk about. Um, the, the ongoing challenge, and I think the problem that we really want to solve, and the reason why we've included this as a school improvement goal once again this year, is to try to figure out how can we ensure that every single one of our students has a powerful service learning opportunity by the time they graduate from Hingham High School. For me, that's a really important personal goal. I know anecdotally, and I'm sure of it, and I, and, uh, I think if you asked any of our students or teachers, they would say, sure, most of our students have a really powerful, in some cases, even life-changing service learning opportunity when they're a student at our high school. But can we say that every single one of our students has had that? That's the goal that I think we want to try to solve. And we're going to continue working on a way to try to systematically get to a point where we can say that, yeah, every one of our kids has participated in something along these lines. Um, 
And uh, we'll try to get closer to that this year as we continue that goal. Uh, second school improvement goal for last year was to foster a positive school climate by expanding community building opportunities. And I'm calling the goal complete, but it's, uh, you feel like that's a goal that's never complete because it's always ongoing. You could never rest on um, having accomplished a positive school climate. Um, it's an ongoing goal, I think, forever and ever, but I'll highlight a few things here that make us feel pretty good about the school climate that we've built at this point. Um, over the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time working with our freshman advisory program and a mentoring program associated with that for an incoming ninth grade students. Uh, photographed there from an event of just a couple of weeks ago, a trivia night for upper class mentors with their freshman advisees. There's a similar event that was held last winter, happened to be a gingerbread making competition that was held in December. Great turnout and the smiles on the faces of upperclassmen alongside their ninth grade advisees, I think, give uh, proof to the, um, to the strength of that mentoring program. Those mentors coming out uh, at the end of the summer, cutting their own summer vacation short a little bit to help at freshman orientation. Um, the Harborman Helping Hingham Day, once again, taking another step forward, I think certainly proves to the strength of school climate. Um, last year, we launched a new awards program that in December we called the Catching Kindness Award. Um, it's a biannual award. It happens at the end of every semester. Uh, I think uh, those of you here on school committee would have received an invitation recently from our social studies director and our foreign language director, Andy Hoy and Erica Pollard, who've really spearheaded this. And um, we'll be running this biannual event for the third time later this week. In March, we renamed the award the Andrew Warhoftig uh, Catching Kindness Award in honor of Andrew, who was a recipient of one of these awards in December, and whose spirit uh, really, I think, will continue to animate this award for a long time to come. On Thursday, we'll be recognizing 60 more students who have been caught, essentially, with a, uh, committing some sort of random act of kindness. And in this third biannual, um, Catching Kindness Award, we're trying to highlight people who ha whose actions have evidenced inclusion because the award ceremony coincides with uh, Inclusive Schools Week. So we're looking forward to that. Hope we'll see some of you, you there on Thursday morning. Other new traditions that emerged last year are seniors visiting their elementary schools. And this is something we had talked about for, for a number of years. We finally made that happen last spring. There's a picture, I think, taken at South. But we had... Um, buses full of kids and many carloads of kids heading off to all four elementary schools and the middle school right after graduation rehearsal last spring. It was a lot of fun, great event. Again, I think continuing to speak to the strength of community and for our students wanting to give back. We plan to continue that again this year. Uh, other new programs that launched last year, the Unified Track Program that got a lot of attention. Uh, you've heard about it here before. This was one of the most feel-good stories of the entire year. And we look forward to that team returning again in the spring. Uh, great METCO program from last December where we brought all of our high school METCO students along with one Hingham peer and one faculty uh, mentor to see Black Nativity in Boston. And that was part of the launch of this year's 50th anniversary of Hingham uh, METCO uh, as one of the uh, original uh, founding towns in the, in the program. Student leadership has been essential to making all of this happen. There's the school culture club that has also become one of our most active and engaged student organizations run by a social studies teacher. Mr. Lockham has done a great job. There's a meeting, uh, I think it's 7.30 in the morning to get a sense of just how many students are turning out to be part of that. Uh, again, student engagement. There's the Neff Cure Walk last year and 5K Run that raised huge amounts of money this year. Uh, we've again seen it with our athletic teams. Uh, there's our golf team raising money for Alzheimer research earlier this fall. Our soccer team raising money for um, NEFCURE and all wearing the name were Hoftig on the back of their jerseys. Mm -hmm. uh, really special moment. And around that same time, our dance team supporting an event down at Wampatuck, the uh, Renegade Run that raises money for type 1 diabetes. Again, these are just kind of a few highlights of the so many ways that our teams and organizations support great causes and then finally also support each other. Some of my favorite photos from the last year. The left is a tournament basketball game all the way down in Taunton in a snowstorm. And our student section was unbelievable. Half of them showed up in costumes. 
Don't ask me why. They just decided to be fun, to show up in costume. <laughs> and you get a sense of the spirit. The photograph on the right is just a few weeks ago. Um, well, maybe four or five weeks ago now. I believe that's the homecoming volleyball game. Right around the time, actually it was the very night that our girls volleyball team clinched their first ever league championship. So all kinds of great stories that, again, give us evidence of, of the strength of school spirit uh, and, and culture. On to our third goal for last year, investigating renewable energy options. Calling this goal in progress certainly remains part of our vision. Um, we have a, a strong goal of expanding solar energy at the high school. It's rooted in a longstanding school commitment to environmental uh, um, values and sustainability. It's part of what helped get Hingham High School the Green Ribbon Award a number of years ago. And um, this idea of seeing something like this on our campus at some point remains a goal for us. It's inspired by what we've seen at other districts. There's a photograph taken at Lincoln Sudbury High School where they have built a solar array over one of their student and staff parking lots. Also inspired by what we've seen locally. If that one looks familiar to you, that's because it's the commuter rail station in West Hingham. And um, so we've been following that. We're hopeful that maybe someday, um, and in the not too distant future, we may be able to explore something similar at the high school. Um, I'll highlight just a few ways in which environmental values and sustainability remain a key part of school culture throughout last year as we continue to move forward on this goal of exploring solar. We again continued the longstanding traditions of uh, a very active green week of rewarding students for random acts of greenness. There's a very green table in the cafeteria at lunch that won a prize during green week. We continue to recognize the Green Apple Day of Service through gardening projects. That's one of our courtyards and our greenhouse to the left. Once again, did the annual sneaker and shoe drive, yielding well over 1,000 pairs of sneakers and shoes. Uh, held our 10th annual teach-in, soliciting close to 90% faculty participation on America Recycles Day last year. <clears throat> There's just one of many projects that happened that day on America Recycles Day. And our current green team advisor, Mr. Woolley, who's a social studies teacher, delivering a very memorable lesson on economics that's related to uh, environmental issues. Um, our Slash the Trash co competition continues all three sports seasons where our athletic teams compete against one another. There's the football team on the day they were responsible for monitoring compliance with recycling and composting in the cafeteria. They did very well but did not set a record as the dance team did last year, continuing their unbroken run, I think, over three years of perfect scores now. Spectacular accomplishments by our dancers. Um, they just can't be beat. Uh, your only hope, I think, if you're another team, is to be a spring team because there's no spring dance team. <laughs> but the fall dance team and the winter dance team have been almost unstoppable. They really have been unstoppable the last few years. The boys' hockey team gave them a great run for their money last winter, and although they didn't beat them, they did become the subject of a feature story in the Boston Globe that some of you may have seen. I think it was last February, possibly March, when it appeared and uh, got almost a full page in the, uh, in the Sunday Globe, highlighting ways that schools are trying to provide fun incentives around environmental issues, and our boys' hockey team did a great job that day. Uh, that the Globe reporter and photographers came out to visit us. In other ways that we're continuing to stride towards sustainability, there's our food services director, Kim Smith, next to the grow towers that are now producing lettuce that can be harvested in the morning and served in the salad bar at lunchtime. It has, uh, it, it's great lettuce. It doesn't have anything wrong with it, even our romaine. <laughs> there's no E. coli. <laughs> So it's fresh, it's healthy, it's delicious. Our botany club on the right is um, chopping it up and making salads, but we see it in our, in our salad bar on a daily basis. Uh, it's been so popular that Kim has um, given us the go ahead to try to recruit classroom teachers to host more grow towers in classrooms because they can be set up anywhere in the building. The ones we have now are down in the kitchen area, but we're looking to add more and to put them into classrooms. So really excited about that as well. Uh, the, um, the student support for these has been tremendous. That actually is a photograph 
of uh, a meeting in Mr. Woolley's social studies classroom. I took it at 7.30 in the morning. You can see maybe about two-thirds of the people who were in the room. There actually were about 60 kids in the room for, I think this was the first or second green team meeting of the year earlier this year. So you get a sense of how it has become a, a really genuine part of school culture and the energy that exists at the school to support these issues. We're seeing results from that. There's a green team member who's using the first hand dryer to come to Hingham High School. At the middle school, it's old news. They put them in all the bathrooms when they built the school. We've never had them in the high school, and we only got them because students in the green team actually raised the money to purchase them. And so they were put in uh, a couple of months ago through, uh, through the fundraising uh, of students and with the help of, um, of our facilities people. And uh, we want to see, are, do they work? And are they too loud? Does everyone like them? And so far, the results have been good, so we'd like to see more of them. Uh, certainly cutting down on, uh, on waste. Uh, we also last spring won for the second time an award given by Mass Recycles. They, uh, they present recycling awards statewide in different categories for everyone from hotels to grocery stores and schools. And Hingham High School was named the top K-12 recycling school in Massachusetts for the second time. And those are last year's green team officers holding the trophy that is made from sustainably grown bamboo. You'll be glad to know. <laughs> and so if you want to see it in person, it's in the front lobby of the high school. Um, solar, though, for us remains a goal. We, we decided at the school council level and continuing to work on this that it may be prudent to, to see how does our community embrace the, um, the solar array at the commuter rail stations and how do those MBTA projects go and what kind of results are yielded there. We're, we're very optimistic and hopeful that the response there is going to be positive. It can help to continue to build support for that kind of thing at the school. We think it's so important that our school district also becomes a community leader in an issue that is, that is so important. We also believe that it could save us significant dollars uh, if it's done properly as well. So we intend to keep investigating and trying to push forward uh, on the goal of solar. And then finally, uh, the fourth school improvement goal from last year to engage in a systematic review of school disciplinary policies. Um, again, in a way, I say this goal is complete. We, we completed the review of the policies we were most interested in reviewing, but this is an ongoing, certainly, issue uh, that, uh, that continues indefinitely. <coughs> One of the highlighted issues uh, as you may recall from last year, um, was an assessment of the growing popularity of e-cigarette products that we've certainly seen locally. It's a national, probably international phenomenon as well. All schools locally are, are dealing with this. And so we, among the many policies that we did review last year, one was a look at our penalties for student use of e-cigarette products, vaporizers, jewels, and others. And we did make a move to stiffen the penalty there. More importantly, I think, expanding our education around those issues as well. A photograph from a student council assembly where a local pediatrician, uh, Dr. Katie McBride, actually came and gave a terrific presentation to our entire student body. So all 1,200 students saw a really good, common sense, I thought very moving, powerful, presentation about the danger of e-cigarettes. We've also um, significantly expanded our curriculum in health classes as well around this important issue. A look at bullying uh, as well uh, didn't necessarily result in any significant policy changes, but last year important uh, professional development time as well devoted to this issue. And you see the, the probably the leading um, local expert and, a, and really even a national the recognized uh, expert on bullying, Dr. Elizabeth Englander, who works out of Bridgewater State University, came and spent a morning with our faculty last year as well um, and, and really did a nice job. She's there with Jennifer Henriksen, our assistant principal, who did a lot of work to make that happen. Um, so that's a look at last year's four, goal, four main goals and I'll highlight the goals that we've identified for this year. The first is to systematically review school security policies and recommend measures to enhance school safety. We've done a lot of work on that already this year through the first several months of the school year. And when our school council meets again on Wednesday night, we'll continue that discussion. Uh, our school council meets monthly. Our second goal is to explore the possibility of expanding the freshman advisory program in order to better serve ninth grade students 
and perhaps also serve students in other grades. This is um, a topic that I think has been on our minds for a long time and, and it got additional impetus from our accreditation report last year when NEASC, uh, the NEASC team visited us last September. This was a highlighted need for them in the report they delivered to us last spring. And so we're, we're spending a lot of time on this goal as well this year. Our third goal is to consider avenues for bolstering civics education across the curriculum. This goal was identified in the spring when it became clear that the Massachusetts legislature was working on a bill, a significant bill, it was later signed uh, over the, uh, the summer by the governor. But even apart from that legislation, which does call for secondary schools and middle schools across Massachusetts to strengthen civics education, we had recognized this as an important avenue to, uh, to explore. And so we'll hof hopefully address ways and explore ways to do more and, and more of that and a better job at that at our high school. And then finally, continue the goal that we had talked about earlier, again, exploring ways to expand service learning opportunities. And, and with the goal, again, that all of our students, not, not just some or, or even most, but all of our students would have a really powerful experience around service learning. And uh, ultimately, moving the school closer to reaching its full potential, its amazing potential, is uh, what we hope to accomplish. So uh, that's all I have on that. That's a, with a lot of photos <laughs> and 50 slides, actually, um, that I tried to move through as quickly as possible. But it, uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Telling Thank telling you. Telling it in pictures is always a nice right, way to do right. it. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Carrie? Yeah. Great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. About goal number one for the upcoming year, improvement mm -hmm. the um, security and safety goal. Have you thought about, um, or has anyone looked into the Sandy Hook Promise Say Any Say Something um, campaign? It's a program that teaches um, students grades six to twelve actually to recognize signs on social media mm -hmm. and, um, and to, to to report it to a trusted adult. I was just wondering if that had come up at all with the school counselor if that was I have some vague familiarity with that program but uh, but not any real expertise in it mm -hmm. and it has not been part of our conversation to this point but it's certainly an ongoing conversation if um, if you think this is something that's worth exploring we certainly would take a look at it and and bring that uh, to our conversation at the school council level great yeah, th yeah. I can send it to you it, it seems like a great program just because I guess a lot of times with uh, and violent situations, it is reported to their friends know about it first, and mm. so um, and it's a free program too, which is right. good. So I'll send it to you, and you could maybe you can take a look. Sure, we'll take a think. look. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Carrie. Um, anything else? No. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so moving on to 6.2, um, to receive the report and presentation for the class of 2018 college testing and placement from Heather Rodriguez. Hello. Hello again. <laughs> um, so I do not have a lot of fancy pictures like you did. I do have okay. a lot of charts and graphs, um, so that will be the fun in my presentation this evening. Um, so this is basically a college board testing and placement report for the graduating class. Um, certainly kids are not just defined by their test scores. They are whole beings with a lot of different talents and activities, but we do like to check in and be transparent about how they're performing um, on standardized tests because that is one measure of their um, preparedness for the future. So this is a very tiny chart if you're don't have it in front of you, but it <laughs> breaks down what the plans of the class are. And we can see that um, total students going on to continuing education, whether that's through four-year colleges, junior or um, two-year schools or prep schools is 94.4% this year, which is um, pretty consistent with what's been happening in the past over a decade. Um, and we have another 3.7 percent going on to employment so those that are not um, continuing education are being fruitful in their efforts um, in employment and then they we have a number of students also going on to gap year programs that may be continuing in their education they're just delaying it for a year or a semester in order to do um, something like working or interning or um, 
doing service projects um, or things like that. So one, um, yeah, okay, that's the end of that. So the next we have the SAT is the first standardized testing um, entity that we'll talk about. It is offered by the College Board. It is pretty standard. However, every 10 years or so, the College Board changes the format of the test slightly. So we saw one of those changes in 2017. Um, so when you're looking at historical data, we can really only compare the 2018 data to the 2017 because that's the same test. The people before that had different versions of the test. The College Board changed the benchmarks. So um, you can't really, it's apples to oranges at that point, even though it is the same test. Um, so this slide just kind of shows you what is tested on the SAT. And this slide just breaks down how many questions are in each section. So it's made up of critical reading and writing is one test. And then the mathematics is the second test. Both of those are based on a score of 200 to 800 um, with a total um, combined score out of 1600. There is an optional writing essay section. Um, not all students have to take that. Most colleges aren't really using that for an admissions process, but they may use it for placement in their um, curriculum once a student is there. So it just depends on the school whether they require the optional writing section or not. And students just need to kind of take a look at what colleges they may be pursuing and what their rules are and see if they need to take that section of the test. and more information about what is on the SAT. Um, we also have a link, I know in the report to the school committee had a link about the benchmarks and um, the SAT really does provide a lot of information about specific questions and the purpose behind them and what skills they measure and they've benchmarked and crosswalked a bunch of different variables. Um, so there's a great deal of information on that. So how did we do? Um, one thing to note for this year's report. So the College Board has a very fancy new um, data and score reporting program that they use. And as part of the rollout of that, they have stopped reporting cohort data and they are reporting school year data. So they used to give us a 2000 or class of 2018 cohort score report. So they would track any graduate in that year's graduating class and what the mean score was for that graduating class, no matter when they took the SAT. So our students tend to start with the SAT for the first time um, for real in the spring of their junior year and they may repeat it again in their senior year. So the mean data was based on the highest score of the student um, no matter what year they took the exam, that has changed for this year. Now they are doing school year based mean data. So it may not, it's anyone who took the SAT in that calendar year, not necessarily in the graduating cohort. So we lose a little bit of our comparison basis because of that, but going forward, we know that that's how it will be. So then we'll have the historical data back on track. Um, but just to note, when we're talking about means, this is, um, for this slide, it is members of the class of 2018, but only in the 17-18 testing year. So any senior who graduated last year, their scores, if they took the SAT in their junior year, are not part of these means it's the latest time that they took the SAT, not their highest score either. So that's a lot of information, a little bit different, a little confusing, but I can clarify if we need to. So this is the class of 2018 only for the 17-18 testing year. So our combined total is a 1221. Compare that to Massachusetts and national. Um, we're higher on both fronts. And then you can, we break it down between the total group reading and writing section and the mathematics section. Um, last year for the first time, we were starting to include some data of students with accommodations. Um, that has also gone away from the College Board, so it's not as easy to find that data. So what I was able to find this year is the state of Massachusetts um, rates district, well, it doesn't rate districts, it provides data for districts on their website. And so they have picked out, instead of students with disabilities or students with accommodations, they specifically um, 
disaggregate special education students and that's defined by any student on an IEP. So that was what I was able to find. So I compared our special education students um, to our total group just so we can kind of see the performance there. So um, it's not as robust as we had last year um, and I'm gonna keep digging and see if I can find a little bit more than what they initially report to us because they are um, constantly enhancing their score reporting on their new website. Um, so, but I'd wanted to include something, so this is what we have. Um, all right, moving forward. SAT subject tests. So SAT subject tests are not as um, long and comprehensive as the SAT. They are hour long tests that um, test students on content in a particular subject so students can show their strength in a particular subject. Um, so one thing to know is there are only three colleges in the country that require subject tests for every single applicant. Um, that's MIT, California Institute of Technology, and Harvey Mudd College. Um, so 13 more recommend or require subject tests if you're applying in some certain major areas. Um, and then a number, I think 13 more, recommend, highly recommend them um, or may require them for different major areas. So subject tests are not something that every single student in the graduating cl class needs to take, but if they feel that they're strong in certain subject areas, they are encouraged to take them because they don't know if they'll need them at some point. Um, and it's always good to show, even if you don't need it, if you feel very proficient in an area, it's always good to show more good information about yourself to colleges, even if it's not required. Um, so also another note on data, this is no longer cohort group data either. It is testing year. So typically it is our freshman students who take biology so typically that's an honors freshman biology student. Um, and so this is not the graduating class. This is for whoever took the test in the 2017-2018 calendar year. So just that's important to note as well. Um, so 16 and 17 are cohort groups. And also. But they would have taken the test their freshman year. Right. Well. Yes. So they may have taken it in 2014. <laughs> but we reported on it in 2016, right. Um, another fun fact is the College Board also, when I made my request for data, they are no longer providing state and national mean scores. I don't know why. I don't know if that's temporary or if that's just how they're going to do it for now, but they gave no other explanation other than I think, and I quoted it in the school committee report that I gave to you, we are not supplying that data. So good to know. That's why the graph looks a little bare in the, <laughs> in the third year. Um, so what's important to know about biology? There are two subject tests in biology. One has an ecological focus, one has a molecular focus, neither of which do our biology classes um, pair up with perfectly for curriculum. Our curriculum is driven by our science standards, and so that's the MCAS test in biology. So that is what our class is structured to meet. So there is certainly some overlap, but it is not a kind of one for one, one, for one preparation like our M, it is for our MCAS exam. Um, so students are told about the exams. Um, and they are told usually, you know, this is on the subject test or these are the subjects that are we don't cover, so you may um, need to do a fair amount of brushing up on your own. So there's a lot when you're do looking at um, some of the science exams, there's more self-study that's required for those. And if our class were to lend itself to one or the other, biology or ecological, it's a little closer to ecological um, than molecular. So with all of that said, um, our mean in the ecological was 613, and we had 26 students sit for the exam this year, um, or yeah, last year. And then in the previous graduating cohort, 40 students sat for the exam. Um, and the year before that, we had 31 students. For biology molecular, we have a mean score of 667, which is right where it was with the cohort of two years ago. 
Um, and we had 25 students take this exam this year and 22 the year previous. For chemistry, um, typically that's taken after the sophomore year. Those would be students in honors chemistry. Um, and students usually take it in June because that's at completion of the course. So that's um, when it culminates and it's freshest in their mind, but certainly they can take it. It's offered every time the SAT is offered, subject tests are. So they don't need to do it on a specific date. Um, we had a mean of 686 and 15 students took the chemistry exam this year, whereas last year's cohort, 22 students had taken it. English literature. 642, we went up a little bit this year, which was excellent. 20 students um, took the test, and that was consistent for the past three years. Math. There are two mathematics subject tests. One is math level one, one is math level two. Um, predictably, math level two goes a little bit deeper into math than math level one does. So many of the students that we see taking math level one have completed algebra two. Um, and a lot of them tend to be in our college preparatory curriculum as opposed to the honors curriculum. So the mean this year was 653, 11 students sat for the exam. In the past year, 17 students sat for the exam and the year before that 27 students sat for the exam so the participation declined a little bit not sure why we'll see if that's a trend after next year or if that was just kind of last year's class um, or it may have something to do with that's only one year's worth of testing being reported as opposed to a cohort group that had multiple years reported on um, so math level two goes up through pre-calculus and trigonometry um, 695 was the mean and 29 students sat for the exam and that was consistent over the past couple of years back to science physics mean of 683 we had 14 test takers 20 last year's cohort and 18 the cohort before so that's pretty consistent a little bit down with the number of test takers um, but we've hung in right with the same general mean U.S. history, um, back where we were two years ago. Last year was a little spike. Um, we did have 11 fewer test takers this year. Um, not quite sure why, but we're pretty consistent there with U.S. history. World history, um, we've reported on for the past few years, but this year we did not have enough students to report a reliable mean, so that's why we don't have a slide on that. So the ACT is your second option when you're looking at um, standardized college testing. Colleges will take either the SAT or the ACT if they require testing. They really do not care which one it is. Um, they're two different styles of tests. The ACT is more content based, more curriculum based, and it's closer to an SAT subject test, although it is longer, in that it tests students on the knowledge that they have. The SAT test is more of a reasoning test, so it will look for a student to use logic and reason their way through the question first to kind of, what are you asking me? What of the given information is relevant? And then can I figure out what the answer is? Whereas the ACT is more straightforward, this is what you're asking this is what we're asking you, do you know the answer? Um, so some students do find the ACT style test is more straightforward and they're a little more comfortable with it. Some students are a little more comfortable with SAT. The vast majority of students will do about the same on both kinds of exams, but we do find some students just their learning style is such that one is significantly different from the other. So we do have a lot of students will try both um, and then repeat the one that was stronger for them because they think that will put them in the best light. Um, that's also why as sophomores we offer students the chance to take a pre-ACT so they get exposure to the ACT type test and then in the junior year we offer the PSAT so they get exposure to an SAT type test so they can take those without them officially counting. They can kind of get exposure to both types of tests so they don't have to pay for and take both types of tests for real to find out which one they kind of get early exposure. Um, so English, math, reading, and science are the four um, content areas covered by the ACT. It is a completely different scoring system. It's scored from 1 to 36 as opposed to 200 to 800. 
Um, and these are our mean scores. So we're pretty consistent with Massachusetts, a little bit above and a more above the national means, um, which is pretty much true for all of our testing when we have that data available. And then from 2008 to 18, you can see the um, decade of history with the ACTs. So it has definitely been growing in popularity. The first year we were able to report, we had 55 students taking the ACT and now we're up to 131 in this year's class um, or last year's class with fairly reliable means across the board. They also did not this year, um, last year they provided a nice little bit of information about students with disabilities and with accommodations. And so the way they framed it was duration of test. Um, so you could see the standard duration and then they broke down means by longer durations, which is typically students who have accommodations for extended time. They did not provide that data again this year. Um, so we will see if that pops back up in future years. I don't know. Um, I did when I was kind of researching why that was. I never found a straight answer, but I did find a number of articles that there is a lawsuit with the ACT and a database that they were selling to colleges and then colleges kind of being able to back end and figure out um, things were taken with extended time and then matching student information to that. So I. I don't know if that is, I'm speculating completely. That's just my own putting two and two together. I don't know if that's the reason, but um, coincidentally, I found out the inf information when I was doing this research. So we'll see next year if it's back. Um, so moving on to AP tests. AP are advanced placement. Um, they are college level courses offered in the high school. And so those exams culminate in May and they're usually about four hour exams. So, um, it is a specific content. All of our teachers have to submit syllabi and get approval from the college board to even be called an AP level class. Um, and scores are from one to five, three is considered passing. So we're looking for scores three, four, or five and what our percentage is um, for AP exams. So last year, we had 26 different exams taken by Hingham High School students. 19 of those AP classes were offered in our building. Seven of those courses were offered through virtual high school. Um, just to note, our one physics class, AP Physics, takes both the electricity and magnetism exam as well as the mechanics exam. So that's a, I was gonna say two for the price of one, but they still charge them for two mm -hmm. exams. So I can't even say that. Um, but they are obligated to take two exams um, when they do take that one course. So we had 324 graduates and 151 seniors took 308 advanced placement exams. So that was 47% of the graduating class was enrolled in at least one AP class. Um, when we're looking at students with accommodations, 11 students took AP exams that had accommodations. That's 4.1% of AP test takers. Um, and those 11 students took 16 exams. So there were a couple multiple um, classes or exams there. Um, we can't report out means for students with accommodations separately because there just aren't enough of them for them to be statistically certain, significant or um, kind of de facto identifying those students. Um, so just a note for the courses that are virtual high school, typically those are offered to students and the district pays for them when it's a master scheduling conflict, when they wanted to take say three AP classes, but two of them happen the, at the exact same time and they have to make a choice schedule wise. Um, or if it's a course that Hingham High School doesn't offer. So economics, environmental science, psychology have been popular courses that we don't offer in our building, but students have taken through virtual high school. So it is um, one of our staff members is in charge of them. They are taught online um, and she just kind of checks in with them and they have the chance to kind of interface with the professors from the virtual high school program but it's not and they have time scheduled in their day um, to complete the course during the school day and log on if they wish but they can also complete it independently so that's just a note some of the classes where you see the asterisk is because we just have either too few students who took the course in our building or too few kids through VHS to report a reliable mean um, we do have that data obviously we're just not showing that publicly 
um, but we have it and we're reflective of it and we use it to inform practice. So those are the mean scores of Hingham students compared to Massachusetts and nationwide. So pretty much everything is above um, state and national means. When we look at the benchmark schools, so those are the communities that we um, compare ourselves to, bless you. Um, we perform very well, bless you, um, against our benchmark communities. This year we are eighth in the state of Massachusetts in terms of passing rate for AP exams with um, 93. And we're tied with multiple other schools at position number eight. Um, The AP program recognizes different levels of scholars. So AP scholar with honor, with distinction, national, and um, so we can see that 102 or 38 percent of our students were honored in some way through that program, which just speaks to the fabulous um, mastery of content that our student has students have in the AP classes. And then finally, um, National Merit Scholarship Competition is based off of junior year PSAT scores. And so students have the chance to um, enter that competition, typically if they score usually within the top 2% of national test takers. Um, the threshold is different in every state. So Massachusetts, for instance, you have to score much higher than you do in Arkansas, for instance. Um, so there are different levels of commendation that students can earn either a commended student we had 10 in the graduating class of 2018 we had one semi-finalist and that semi-finalist actually did move on to become a finalist which has not happened since we had two students do that in 2014 so that's a great honor um, and we're very happy for that student so that concludes the presentation part if I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has questions lots of information lots of information <laughs> and it's a lot of data and it's I dare I say fun to look at all <laughs> of it because um, you can really drill down a lot yeah. and get a lot of good information um, and that's sometimes I wish I had more time to keep doing well, yeah. that no no it is good and the d d drilling down into the data you can really see it and you can sort of see you know that the students continue to challenge themselves yes. and that the teachers continue to just do a phenomenal job in preparing students for post high school yes. graduate life. Yes. So, Carrie. Yeah, that was actually what I was going to say is that um, clearly our students are really well prepared for these exams when they go in, which is really great. My question is actually about the percentage of students who participate who take one or more uh, AP classes. Yes. And it's a, you said it was 47 percent. Yep. I was looking, so I was looking at our benchmark towns, and I couldn't find the 2018 data for all of them. But it was right, like, I was looking yep. at the historical data, kind of, yeah, because it, it doesn't fluctuate that much from year no, to year. right, it's so, pretty consistent. And of those towns, most of them, uh, their participation rate is more like in the high 50 percent to the high 60 percent. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if uh, this is Rick here too, if you had any thoughts about why our per uh, participation is a relatively low um, mm -hmm. for the benchmark towns and is has there been any discussion about trying to increase participation so more kids take the AP classes right I mean there's definitely um, just in the general community there's a lot of discussion between exposure and mastery so having there's a lot of merit to having a student even if they get a one on the exam be just exposed to college level course um, so there's definitely something to that. I haven't been part of any specific discussion on what our percentage is and how we're getting it and comparing the percentage of test takers, um, mm -hmm. but that's certainly something that to be reflective of. Um, yeah. it, it could be, Carrie, and I, I don't know for a fact, but I know with some schools, our school offers the AP, the honors, mm -hmm. the, like the different levels, levels, and other schools only offer AP or, or college prep, yeah. mm -hmm. the standard. And so that there isn't that choice of taking that honors level. It's not offered. Mm -hmm. And so that that could be some of the difference with some of the schools um, that, you know, we, we have different offerings. Mm -hmm. to, um, so that's, that, that is part of it in certain schools. 
um, <coughs> of what's even available to people. So, yeah, it's um, interesting. Is that the reason? It's not, I'm not saying it's the only reason, but Carol, do you want to add to it? That is true. Other towns do not necessarily right. do that. So you may have kids that take an AP test because they don't need to take, I mean, an AP course because they don't need to take the test at the end of the year. No, but this was the, the test, the participation oh, on the, the test testing. itself. Okay. Yeah, not the classes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that might also be, could that also be students are more willing to take the class if they don't have to take the test <coughs> at the end? Like they're taking it just to learn the content versus okay. maybe a little, so it's probably. There's probably several different factors yeah. in it. Yeah, I would guess. Yeah, but that's definitely something worth yeah. checking with our benchmark schools to see if they yeah. like what. Well, yeah. Rick. There's also been a lot of discussion at department levels, and I think in particular a couple of really popular senior electives, psychology, mm -hmm. environmental science, figure that lots of other schools have become almost de facto those are AP courses. Yep. If you're taking psychology as a senior <coughs> in a lot of other schools, and I'll use Duxbury as an example, because I was a department director there in social studies before coming to Dean 10 years ago, and more than half of all seniors at Duxbury High School at that time, and I'll bet it's probably true today, were taking AP psychology. There, there was no other psychology. We took psychology, it was AP psychology, and um, I, I think these, what I saw there, from true, a lot of schools do environmental science are very similar as well. Those are really popular courses at our school, but we don't offer them anymore. Level. And there have been discussions uh, in, in each of those departments, in social studies and science, about should we transform these into AP courses? Uh, and, and the outcome of those discussions so far has been that we really value the independence of our own curriculum as opposed to the college board's curriculum and the ability to make those uh, more open-ended courses that are offered at, at various levels mm -hmm. for students as well. So you, you could take it for, for, honor, for honors credit, you could take it for college, lets us keep some more flexibility and those re remain really good strong programs but they're not going to lead to an AP exam mm -hmm. for students uh, so that I think that probably depresses our number a little bit mm -hmm. but uh, <coughs> doesn't take into account the strength of those programs that right. you know, kids are still taking them in really big numbers and they're growing because kids are getting a lot out of them mm -hmm. but they're, they're not getting as the AP system. Okay. Great. well thank you Thank you, and, and this is great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, I think um, the, the VHS courses. Yes. So that seems to be growing mm -hmm. in numbers. Um, are you doing any evaluation by the students at the end of the course that whether they enjoy the experience or are? I, I'm sure that um, I had a child who took one, yeah. and it's very enticing. Yes. To add another AP course or, or add a different mm -hmm. subject that like the environmental science, you know, we didn't offer it and or it fit in your schedule. Right. But it was a real challenge. It is. It's and, a different format. Yeah. Um, so is, I'm, I'm glad kids are getting the opportunities, but then are, do we have feedback of I, how it's I don't going? know if, so Glenda Garland, our, yeah. um, is our facilitator. I don't know if she does. Do you know if she does any kind of surveying at the end, um, which is something we can certainly look into. I know different kids take those for different reasons. Yeah. And so yeah. even kids who aren't like, hey, the online format is exactly what I'm looking for. And I'd love to learn a class that way. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's reluctant because it is, I wished I could fit it in, but I just have to make a choice. And mm -hmm. so that's not the environment that they're looking for. Okay. So I think it would probably depend on, you know, did the student really want to sign up for a VHS class because it was an online course offering or were they kind of defaulted into it? So you probably would get a range of opinion based on did they, how excited were they about that format in the first place. Yeah. But yeah, that's definitely something we can look at and see. Um, anecdotally, I've heard a wide range just yeah. from my students who have done it. Some love it because they can go at kind of at their own pace mm -hmm. and they fly through and some were worried because they haven't been keeping up with the course and we need to have conversations with yeah. them so there is a wide range of how students kind of handle the online environment 
Yeah, or maybe even just giving that feedback to the kids before they sign up. Like we do, we think, try okay, to right, right and that's, that's when the counselors that, are that's very what I care about. <laughs> right when they have to make a choice. Yeah. we have a lot of discussion with the school counselor, with the department yeah. chair, maybe with a former teacher, to say, okay, if you have to make a choice between one, two, or three online, which one makes the most sense? Usually, if a foreign language is in there, we're like, mm, unfortunate, not unfortunately, but that one is very difficult online. So being in that class even if that may not be your number one thing, usually makes the most sense. Or if it's a science with a lab, that makes yeah. sense to take in person. So sometimes like the English, well, sorry, Mary, <laughs> will have to default to being the one taken online because even though it's discussion based, yeah. you can read a novel and analyze it, you know? So there's a lot of different How many factors. years has it been? Four, I think 2013, three? if I recall, okay. was the first year that we year. kind okay. of, um, started it yeah. with more than one or two kids yeah. um, because I think in the data you saw there were a couple that reflected um, the historical data yeah. chart had VHS offerings and then one of the first years which I think was 2012 yeah. 2013 there had a couple, a couple that said students. done through independent study yeah. so that was not a VHS they just kind of studied for an AP exam mm -hmm. completely on their own and that was the time when we were like okay if they're doing that maybe yeah. we want to investigate online options so yeah great okay. Only uh, yes, over the course of their high school career. We've had, I've had, I think, six in one year was the record that wow. I've seen, which I don't know how that's humanly possible. And then you also <laughs> see friends and sleep. Um, no, but they got thing. through it, <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, over the course, our only sophomore um, AP courses, AP World History, and then um, a few more open up in junior year and then more in senior year. So over a course of a high school career, you can definitely get more in. But yeah, there are a few that'll do a few at a time and that's definitely tough. <laughs> They're rigorous. Yes. All right. Anything else? No. Thanks everybody. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Great job. Thank you, Heather. All right, moving on to item 6.3 to receive an update on the superintendent search process. So I'll turn it over to Liza and I'm okay. sure Carlos might have a few things to add as well. Um, so we have a big update tonight. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, and um, the work of the screening committee has completed and I saw Christine Smith oh, and Mary Beth Barber, two of our members are with us tonight. So, um, and so this committee was established to assist the school committee in identifying candidates um, to succeed uh, Dr. Gallo, who's retiring at the end of the year. And I did brief Dr. Gallo on this announcement um, yesterday prior to us doing this, so she's up to speed. Um, so for the past four weeks, the screening committee met on several occasions and we reviewed the search process with them so they'd be informed. Um, the screening committee prepared questions, um, reviewed the applications and interviewed several candidates um, for the position of superintendent of schools. And following these interviews and after much discussion and consideration by the committee, um, on uh, November 27th, the committee voted unanimously to recommend four candidates for further consideration by the school committee. And um, the four candidates, the school committee has this report in front of them and I have extra copies um, up here for anyone in the audience that would like to take that home with them. Um, so in alphabetical order, uh, Dr. Paul Austin, who's currently superintendent of schools in Maine at Regional School Unit 3 in Waldo County, Maine. He also previously worked in Brunswick, Maine um, as director of student services, which is a town that's very similar to, to Hingham in demographics and size. Um, Dr. James Labilla, our currently assistant superintendent of Hingham Public Schools and who was instrumental in establishing some of our newest initiatives with computer literacy and um, social emotional learning initiatives. Uh, Dr. Earl Metzler, who's currently superintendent of schools in New Hampshire, um, a regional um, area, they, they have unit 55 that serves 
communities of Atkinson, Danville, Hampstead, Plaistow, and Sandown, New Hampshire. Um, and he was previously the principal at North Quincy High School and other schools in Quincy, so um, South Shore native. Um, and then Dr. Donna Strait, who's currently Assistant Superintendent of Student Services in North Andover. Um, and I'll note she also has other experience that in her hometown she served on the school committee and the finance committee in her community as well. Um, all these candidates do meet requirements for the Massachusetts Educator Licensure for General District Superintendent, even though some of them are from out of state. Um, the committee noted that all of these leaders are student-focused leaders um, with strong communication skills. All of them have extensive special education backgrounds and all are experienced with calling snow days, so, which was a <laughs> question that came up. Um, and the resumes of each candidate, um, they, I have hard copies available here tonight, but um, they also are going to be are posted tonight on the superintendent search webpage so that um, anyone can see them. Um, so just for a little more background on what the screening committee's activities were, um, we selected these um, four candidates um, as further review to find the right match for Hingham. So we encourage everyone to participate in the process as we go further to really refine of which one is really the best for us. Um, so we reviewed, uh, we received 19 completed applications um, from all across the Northeast. Um, we invited seven applicants for preliminary interviews and then narrowed it down to the four. Um, I can say that um, but we had very enjoyable conversations with all these applicants and they did represent a wide range of experiences and backgrounds. Um, also attached um, to your report are the questions that were posed to all of the candidates um, and also additional questions that the screening committee prepared as drafts to, but we didn't end up, we, we may have used them or, or not but um, so each, each candidate, we did ask specific questions of them as well. But, um, and so we thank all of the candidates who applied and expressed interest in becoming our next school district leader. Um, so uh, I'd also like to add on behalf of the school committee and the town of Hingham, um, like Carlos and I would like to thank the 15 members of the screening committee for their time and talents devoted to reviewing applications, interviewing the candidates, and deliberating during the preliminary selection process. Um, the committee's conversations were lively, insightful, and courteous, with the diversity of the committee contributing to a productive process. Um, we had 15 people that were truly covered all aspects of our community and demographics as well as the staff and it was a really great conversation and um, everyone's different points of view uh, contributed tremendously um, to the value of selecting these people. So in particular I do want to extend a, we want to extend a thank you to Susanna Callahan who volunteered to serve as our secretary. Um, and kept dubious notes, which was critical in this. So it was a pleasure to work with everyone um, and all of these truly dedicated people. So thank you again to the entire screening committee um, for all your time. And I would like to note that uh, the New England School Development Council, NESDAC, did advise the screening committee um, with the interviewing process, and they will continue to assist the school committee as we go through the remaining steps, um, up to and including the final selection and contracting with the superintendent. So, um, so as just as I mentioned before for the audience, there's more information here on each of the candidates and you can go home with that. So as next steps, um, the school committee now assumes control of the superintendent search process um, and 
So just a few uh, next steps we have to do. Um, first, we ask that the school committee would accept this report of the screening committee and so we can proceed with the process of interviewing and vetting the candidates that were recommended. Um, do you want to do that so, now? Sure. So can someone can make a, a motion? motion? Carrie? Accept the report of the screening committee and proceed with the process by interviewing and vetting the candidates recommended. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Great. Carlos. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Any opposed? Thank Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next step is to invite the candidates to the district um, in the very near future um, to meet with all stakeholders, including central office staff, the faculty and staff, community members, and students. Um, and the school committee should identify dates as soon as possible to allow NESDEC to schedule each of the candidates. So um, we have been working on identifying dates. Um, and one of my questions to everyone is um, NESDEC is recommending that we do two candidates on a day. So do two days with two candidates. And I wanted to make sure that that was good with everybody. Um, okay, so we'll identify two dates with an alternate date so that the candidate, make sure we get the candidates on the dates that we identified. Um, so hopefully um, we can get that done tomorrow and then we can uh, inform the community of when those dates will be. We don't know if we'll let you know which people are coming on which dates, but at least people can block their calendars. Um, and then on Thursday night, the salary negotiation subcommittee will chair a meeting for the full school committee, and this is a public meeting. Um, and we will be discussing the next steps in the search process, and NESDEC will be joining us to help us with the meeting. <laughs> and so we will plan the <coughs> visit to the district, and then um, the NESDEC will also advise us about the interviewing process, and we'll review more sample questions. And the, the public question process, we'll talk about how we want to handle that. And also reference checking and all. Uh, and if you would all please bring your calendars to that meeting too, because I'd like to identify the dates if we visit the candidates in their districts. And then also planning a date for voting, um, because we have a busy January with budgets. And I think it would be good if we just set that right. as soon as possible and fit that into the schedule. Um, so that's about it. So Thursday we'll get into the days that the candidates are here and everyone can participate in lots of different aspects of it so that you get to know the candidates um, further and in more detail. Um, but that's, so that's it. And, um, this memo and the profiles are on the website now, so <laughs> you can go home and take a look, or anybody at home that should be able to click on and see it. Um, and then we will communicate out as fast as possible to people. Next steps. Liza, will they be on that um, address, the web address on the um, Yes. Yes. Uh, I just yeah. really want to thank you, Liza and Carlos, and the members of the screening committee for all your work on this. This is a, it was a lot of work, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It it was a lot of work, but it was a fascinating. It is a fascinating process, and um, I, the candidates are really all great candidates, and I'm excited for the community to meet them and give us our feedback. Um, Please, everyone, we'll set up a format for getting feedback, or at least our email addresses are there. But um, we want to know what people think. Yeah, very bad. Thank you so much, Liza and Carlos. I was really amazed by your dedication and your hard work. The amount of time that you put in it, keeping everything organized and in gear, I was so impressed. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> <laughs> and Christine and all the other members. 
screening committees and they are um, very interesting and it's a very interesting process very different than interviewing people in a private sector role um, so but it is a great process and again just to reiterate thank you to Carlos and Eliza for and leading the effort and John Ferris I was like that's okay used to it <laughs> but thank you everybody because it, it was great efforts and thank you for putting great candidates forward and now some more work begins for, yes, yes. for the full school committee. So yes. thank you. How much yes. Um, we allocated an hour, an hour for each person. Okay. Uh, just the answer questions part, correct? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> the research ahead of time. All right. That's all right. Well, great. Thank you again, everyone. All right. Um, Moving on to 6.4, uh, to receive notification of the overnight field trip to the HHS DECA Club to the Quincy Marriott on January 10th through 11th. So that's in your packets. Does anybody have any questions, comments on that? <coughs> no? All right. Great. Um, item 7. Any items not reasonably known 48 hours in advance of this meeting? No? All right, great. Um, subcommittee and project reports. Uh, all right, we just had our salary negotiations yes. subcommittee. Um, Carlos, do you want to give us our long range planning update? So, uh, long range uh, held a walk around Plymouth River this past Saturday uh, together jointly with the Food School Committee. Uh, we had representatives of the town, the Board of Selectmen. Um, Advisory, capital outlay, um, who else? Um, had everyone in there. And um, there was, Doug uh, Foley. Facilities was there. Hey, facilities. Uh, so it was well represented. What we usually do every year, we choose a location, one of the schools, to walk around and show and tell our um, partners, uh, you know, what exactly, what projects may come up on the pipeline as we applying for additional money with a capital outlay. Um, so it was very, very productive. Uh, we spent uh, two and a half hours there, uh, had a great conversation, and got to see Plymouth River. Uh, you know, everything that it is, there is to Plymouth River. Um, and you all know that we are also trying to find additional money through other venues. Uh, Libby worked very hard in putting together a, uh, a grant um, uh, with CPC. So um, we are hopeful that CPC will approve um, our grant and that will, they will, you know, if they do, they'll be providing to us about $88,000 to um, renovate the playgrounds and make them, you know, uh, ADA compliant. So that will be a huge deal because obviously uh, we have been applying uh, to capital outlay and, uh, you know, keep pushing aside uh, because there is other competing projects. So um, let's hope that that happens. If it doesn't happen, then we have to find the money other, you know, in another area and try to fix that playground before it shut it, do shut it down. We cannot afford to shut it down. It, it is important and very imperative for the youth to uh, have you know, outdoors uh, activities, so we need the playground. Um, the other thing is we are planning in meeting. We, we were planning a meeting uh, on the 12th and the 17th. But I guess they'll be competing with. Uh, no, 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 we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll work. We work we'll that work out. it out. All right. That's Thursday. So that's pretty much it. And uh, do you want my liaison now? Or? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, high school uh, stu uh, council will be meeting this Thursday, this Wednesday at 5 p.m. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Community outreach. Kay is not here, but you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, you inserted. I thought we had the 10th, December 10th, and December 10th. So yeah, but we have to uh, now work it out with yeah, uh, Liza we'll first. Okay. We'll figure everything out. I'll okay. let you know on that, Thursday. If, That's fine. If we need yeah. to, we'll work it out. Okay. Yep. Good. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm just making this up the note here. All right. Um, all right, so Kay is not here. She um, asked me to. Oh, she asked you to do it. Great. Yeah. All right. Uh, so um, 
we uh, met and, and had some uh, pretty good agreements on a, a few things. And sorry, and it, this is the update on community outreach. Community Just outreach yep. update. Um, so we have some recommendations, and then we also have one question to pose to the uh, board on which we're going to need to make a group decision. So um, the recommendations are that we, as a, uh, the school committee, uh, continue to use the Hingham Public Schools uh, Facebook page to um, post information. And the website. Right. And the website. Yeah. Um, and that the official spokesperson will be the chairperson. Um, so when a subcommittee has a piece of news that they want to post, um, they should send it to both Kay Prashma, who will be the, the person actually physically posting it, but then also the chairperson, because then the chairperson is, would be responsible for knowing about it and right. commenting and re replying to it if there's anything that comes from it, if there's any <coughs> discussion that follows. Okay. Um, so as far as procedure goes, that's the recommendation from the Community Outreach Committee. The question um, about whether we uh, should be sharing to other pages uh, is um, hard to decide and um, <coughs> we've got different opinions and sort of feel like we need to bring in the full committee. Um, you know, do we want to be posting on um, or, or sharing to all of the different pages or websites and I'm sorry because the, the lingo is a little bit r hard for me to get the nuances and the differences between but what I'm talking about is you know if we're going to share something we would share it to SNAP, CPAC, Him Hingham Pinboard, Hingham Pinboard 2.0, Hingham Education Pinboard, Friends of Hingham, you know whatever all of those pages are. And do we want to do that or not and just stick with the Hingham Public Schools page? So the argument, because we did disagree, had a big discussion about it in the meeting, um, the argument for sharing, and maybe not to every single board, but and certainly not every single post, but the idea is to be proactive rather than reactive to news. So it's if, if we're the one, or it would be Michelle <laughs> but the, doing it, if she's the one putting it out there, then she knows it's coming. She knows there are going to be comments. If we just put it out on the Facebook page itself, it'll sit there and then somebody else can take it and do whatever they want with it and we won't necessarily know what's going on. So that's, the, that's kind of the argument, it's just kind of getting on top of it and getting out in front of any news. And it, it, again, it wouldn't be everything that you would share, but it would be, so tonight's update about the superintendent search. That might be something we want to get to a broader audience than, we only have, we have like a thousand plus people that follow the page, but the Hingham's bigger than that. So, and even the families themselves. So that's that's kind of the argument to, to be proactive about it. But it, it looks that there was, we had a lively discussion about it and we thought the whole community, sh or the whole committee should probably weigh in on it. My opinion on that is that I have no problem with, uh, as recommended, that you know the chair, <coughs> along with the uh, the chair of the uh, community outreach, uh, I'll, you know, in charge of disseminating the you know uh, the, the information, and also I'm I'm in favor of sharing the mm -hmm. um, you know whatever the post is. My only thing is my concern is that when you share anything and you leave open for true comments, you may lose track and depending on what people are asking and saying it, it's out of control because you're not there to represent the schools uh, or the school committee. Uh, so it's kind of a little dangerous. Now, I would be in favor of sharing, but when in, anytime we share something that we turn off comments. comments yeah. We I mean. must turn off comments. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I would also would be in favor of whatever it is, the information that we put in out there, that on the bottom there is a disclosure that you know, uh, the official communication, uh, this is an official communication of the school, the Hingham Public Schools. If you'd like to make any comments um, or state your opinion, you need to email such and such or you need to go to our page 
just so that way, sort of like you know, the, the you know, the other places is not the, the places for comments uh, because it could get out of control. And some of us may see it, but I, I honestly, I'm not going to go on social media defend uh, something mm -hmm. right. because I don't want to be responsible for it. We speak as one body. I, I'm just going to have to take a pass. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Right. Are we voting on this tonight? I don't, I don't think yeah, so. I think it's really just a discussion about oh. what we're I'm going to have to get up to speed then. <laughs> <laughs> so add to that note, though, I did reach out to Tracy Novak, who does the um, community, she does the social media for MASC, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, mm -hmm. and she is willing to come do a workshop for us on, tr on social media if people are interested. So yeah. just said we, we, I can follow up with her. Sounds that like a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was really good. I went to a, one of the panels. I mean, I'll wait to see what you think. But I'm, I'm leaning towards Carlos as well, because I do think particularly as we're in the midst of this um, superintendent search, right, that getting information out there to as many people as we can mm -hmm. will be helpful. Um, but also not being one who is sort of very active on social media, um, unless it's posting videos of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't tend to go on it very often, so I would sort of not like sharing something and then sort of walking <coughs> away from it for two weeks and then coming back two weeks later and being like, oh my gosh, there were all these comments and I didn't see these questions. So if, the, if you can share and disable comments, I think that's yeah fair and then also to sort of you know this is you know a, this is on behalf of the school committee or whatnot and if you have questions <coughs> comments please email call whichever the whatever the direction is the there. Disclosure there. Yeah. yeah what are your thoughts Eliza yeah I I, I did want to avoid discussion mm -hmm. on social media because we, we can't govern that way yeah. and um, it, and it's we want to get eyes seeing things um, and make sure people are informed um, but we want to keep the discussion here and also that all of us see it um, which is you know if, if one person gets on to a page and sees a long discussion about something and somebody else doesn't see it you know then that distorts the conversations as well so um, I guess I'd like I think we should think this through a little bit yeah. further and I like the idea of using the Hingham Public Schools page because even that if anyone could share that on their own personal page if not even us but anyone from the community can of expanding you know noise um, but I think we definitely need to have one standard procedure of the initial mm -hmm. um, message, and I'm fine with the community outreach chair and the chair of the school committee managing that. That's that's perfectly fine. That's consistent with our policy. So, um, but I and I also I recognize that people are getting news from social media and. Um, but then do we also like encourage the principals to share certain messages <coughs> on their Twitter feeds as opposed to only the community social media pages? So I think, or maybe we can come up with, when we have an announcement, we know where it's going and that it gets shared. Um, so I think we should just think through the kind of the steps a little bit more, but um, and you know, get a social media policy in place so that all of this is governed by something um, would be helpful. Just to <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sorry, <Right. laughs> um, I mean, and, and even just for our own sources that are our own employee and like staff sources, social media, let alone all the other stuff. But um, I think you know we should also have that in place to keep this calm, you know, let's, let's refine it. Um, but for this purposes, we're just talking about yeah, the yeah. school committee's social media policy right. for yeah. ourselves. Well, specifically sharing. Right. And so um, I should weigh in on why I don't think we should share it. Um, and that's because 
I think that what we should do is be driving people towards the Hingham Public Schools page. And if they want to know what's going on in the Hingham Public Schools, then they can follow that page. And um, it's, I'm, I for one, follow all of those other pages that I just mentioned. And then when I see the same message eight times, I'm like, oh my God, please stop. And I, I feel like it's, um, it's, it's too much. And it's, <coughs> Uh, I can manage where I get my information from. You don't need to give it to me in 20 different places. And it's up to me to decide where I'm going to get my information. And, and I think that the Hingham Public Schools page is the appropriate place to get it from the school committee and the public schools because we want to be on the same page and we want to present that to the community that we are. So, um, but. But we're not, and then if you share it, then you get into all of the questions about, well, who do we share it to, and why aren't we sharing it to this group, but we are sharing it to that group. And it gets complicated really quickly, and I don't want to, we don't need to complicate things. Keep it simple. The simpler, the better. So that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. The thing so is, let's yeah. talk. The thing is, a lot of people really do need to be, you know, need it to be in different places, because people are on different, in different places, so. Um, that's kind of, I don't know, I, I like Carlos's idea of just disabling the comments because that mm -hmm. takes away um, any worry about discussion moving on to social media. The one thing is that I also like the idea of um, making sure there's an outlet so people do have feedback or thoughts right. on it that they're able to, it's not just going to sit there and fester. <laughs> so. Right, right. So, all right. So, so Michelle, c could um, uh, Carrie, I would like to invite the uh, expert from Ma the Mass Association of School Committee. Mm -hmm. Could we do that on the 7th uh, of January? Um, is our next meeting, if it is possible? That would be a better topic for a workshop. Yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. going to take a while. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. So let's uh, okay. think about the date. Okay, we'll talk about some right. dates. Fine. Thank do you. you. Want to, okay. Should we shoot for January? No. Sure. No. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Why well, you want to get it done in December? Because we have budget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe February. Because we, yeah, okay. we have budget. To okay. Super right. So yeah, yeah. yeah. February. So maybe early March. <laughs> Um, all right, great. Yeah, yeah, a lull between the budget closing and town meeting right, would yeah. be a better, be a better time. time right? <laughs> we'll need something for the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> or for ourselves. Um, all right, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Libby, for yeah. that. Um, all <laughs> so right, so more to come. Um, um, Libby, since you're up, do you have any oh. updates from HEF? Anything? They're having a holiday party tomorrow night. All right. That's it. All right. <laughs> great. And they're still, um, okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, policy Subcommittee Kay is also the chair of Policy Subcommittee. Um, she's not here tonight, but we have our next Policy Subcommittee meeting 10 o'clock Friday. Um, uh, December 7th. So we should be there. Um, special Ed Subcommittee. We are not going to be able to meet um, December 12th. Um, I'm out of town. Sorry. Um, and also, I think we have, I don't think there was anything pressing to meet about, so I think we're going to table a December meeting and have one in January. And I would spoken to Tim Dempsey about this. Um, we are going to have to move our special ed subcommittee meetings for scheduling reasons um, to, I don't know what day of the week, but I'll circle back with Carrie and um, Liza to schedule a good date. Um, and then um, CPAC has an executive board only meeting on the 12th, so um, Tim and I spoke about that as well. And I'm the, typically the liaison for the CPAC, but I don't think we need a representative at that meeting because it's an executive board meeting. Um, open meetings. Oh yes, so. yes. So anyone could come, but they're going to be. It's more of a planning session, my understanding. Yes. All right. Great. Um, am I? Oh, snap days. Uh, yep. Winter programs are open. We just started swimming on Sunday, and it was great. So, um, SouthwestSnap.com, and we can register. <laughs> great. Um, any. School council updates from anyone? Or? Uh, East is going to be having a for, a forums on the 17th, um, one, in, one at 9 a.m. and one at 7 p.m., I believe, um, for people to come and give feedback. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, well, our next regular school committee meeting is not until January 7th, um, but we will have 
lots of meetings between now and then between subcommittee meetings and search committee meetings. Um, but other than that, and then we also, um, just everybody's calendars, we have a budget <laughs> session on January 3rd, 7 o'clock. So sort of every Thursday, if we need to, in January, we'll have budget sessions. We, we did forget the CPC yeah, um, presentation. We do have another presentation on January 2nd at uh, 8.30 p.m. Oh. So <laughs> add that to the calendar <laughs> for us. <laughs> I don't know well, that we're going to have a whole lot to 8.30. Um, all right, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.